Hello and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the pensions team at Gowling WLG and PSIT. Today we'll be presenting some fascinating findings from research that we've carried out on pension scheme trustees' attitude to de-risking. What are pension schemes in the UK really doing to de-risk and what do you really need to know? I'm Ian Chapman Curry and I'm joined today by Chris Stiles and Ben Golby from the pensions team at Gowling WLG by James Devil and Wayne Phelan from PSIT. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 <laughs> Today's webinar will last for approximately 45 minutes with time for your questions at the end. So what we're going to be covering. Ben's going to be opening up with an overview of the survey results, and then we'll hand over to Wayne and Ben to look at some of the de-risking strategies and the importance of IRM in, as part of that. James and Chris are then going to be looking at some of the impediments around de-risking and how to overcome them. Then everyone's going to be coming together to talk about benefit specifications, clean data, and some of the pitfalls. But before we start, just some brief housekeeping points. The webinar player has a few very simple controls. The most important are the volume adjustment and full screen option, which are in the bottom right hand corner of the player. And you can also click on speakers to find out more about the presenters. You can ask us a question at any time. Just click on the Ask a Question tab, type in your question, and click Submit. And we'll try to answer as many questions as possible in the time available. And now over to Ben for an overview of the survey results. Thanks very much, Ian. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. And a special thanks to everybody who filled out the survey for us, which is the uh, whole reason that we're here today. So I've somewhat ambitiously gone for a drum roll here at the start, but uh, we are revealing the survey results for the first time. So uh, onto the headline results, and you'll see there that uh, de-risking is much more popular than even we thought it was. 91% of you have it on your agendas over the next three years. Just some interesting information there about where these results come from. So we've had around 70 responses from scheme sponsors, uh, pensions managers, trustees, professional trustees, advisors, everybody who's involved in the lifetime of a scheme. Uh, and you can see that there's a wide range of different types of scheme and different sizes of membership and indeed value. So if we can move on to the next result. So 70% of you believe that de-risking is now developed jointly between the trustee and the sponsor. Uh, and I think that's very encouraging, particularly for uh, the regulator, who's very keen on encouraging that. I suspect that had we done this five or ten years ago, we might have got a slightly different response, but uh, that's definitely encouraging from our perspective because it feeds into everything we're going to talk about with integrated risk management, uh, which Wayne and I are going to come on to talk to you about in a little while. Um, and an interesting difference here between the small schemes, which tend to be more trustee-led, and the larger schemes, um, believing that the present is much more jointly developed. So, looking at the importance now of agreeing a strategy, now 54% of our respondents haven't got an agreed de-risking strategy in place yet, and I think this probably fits with our experience of the market, that everybody's got it on the agenda, but how we actually go about doing this and how the strategy is developed is still up for grabs at the moment. Uh, the larger schemes slightly more likely than the smaller schemes to have the strategy in place, but we're going to talk a little bit about what that strategy looks like uh, in the next part of this webinar, and we're also going to look at how different schemes of different sizes can approach it and the role of the independent trustee in helping you with that. So, a few regrets, we've certainly all had a few around this table. Um, a third of those responding to the survey said that they regret not getting to the de-risking sooner. And Again, interesting to note the difference here between uh, hedging approaches. So larger schemes are more likely to have hedged, whereas the smaller schemes are less likely to have done so. And also looking at the buy-in, buy-out market, only 15% of those who responded have already done a buy-in and buy-out. And we're going to have a little look at what the market looks like in 2017, what the capacity is like as compared to the expectation, and some of the trends in the market going forward. So, looking at clean data, which is obviously everybody's favorite topic, um, we will come on to look at the importance of how clean your scheme's data is. Uh, but we were quite surprised by this number. This is quite high. 69% um, 
of those responding to the survey believe that their scheme data is clean. We're just going to have a look at what scheme clean scheme data actually looks like and also the importance of the benefit specification and getting that agreed and in place before you approach the market. So looking at the time frame, and this is again an interesting result from our perspective that more than half aren't looking at targeting insurance over the next three years and we're going to come on and look at all the tools available to you for a de-risking strategy and how buy in and buy out is just a, a, a small part of that picture actually. Um, and also that more than half of you believe that it will be over 10 years before you're able to transact and, and what some of the reasons behind that might be and how maybe that time frame can be moved forward as well. And finally, we're going to have a look at the impediments and challenge some of the myths maybe that have grown up in the industry over, over the years, looking at whether or not uh, finance is the, the key driver, the key, the key block, as it were, to uh, de-risking, and in particular challenging the, the theory that the sponsors' uh, lack of finances might be the main re the reason for this. Um, actually, less than a quarter of those responding said that that was going to be the main obstacle to de-risking. Pleased to see that Brexit isn't too big an issue for everyone, although uh, feel free to ask us questions along the way if that is posing a problem to your scheme. Uh, we feel that there's enough Brexit in the news at the moment, so we're going to focus on uh, de-risking from other, other avenues. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Wayne now, and he and I are going to discuss de-risking strategies and how they might be tailored to your scheme. Great. Thanks, Ben. So obviously we've moved on to the food session. So I've got a pie, which uh, sadly there's no pie physically in the room in front of me, which is a bit of a shame, but uh, uh, set aside my disappointment and perhaps focus a little bit around de-risking. And um, probably not that long ago, people's view was I run the scheme and then I buy it out. And I think it was seen as uh, mechanically simple as that. Uh, I think we've seen in recent years a lot more thought around that, particularly as most schemes have drifted away from being able to secure their liabilities with an insurance company. So there's been a couple of uh, really key elements to this. The, the first one is managing your liabilities, so looking at some of the liability management exercises. And some of these are really just about tidying up the records a little bit before you get there, so trivial commutation exercises, for example, don't, by the very nature of the fact that they're trivial, really deliver much in terms of reducing your liabilities in any way, shape, or form. But they do mean that when you go to transact, you don't have lots of small um, entitlements that might be unattractive. On the other hand, we've seen the rise uh, of flexible retirement options. Uh, certainly, most schemes have been helped by uh, various changes that have come through that have really thought about pensions as being a bit more flexible from a member's perspective. So. These are now less controversial for trustees, I think, to accept. And our old friend, things like enhanced transfer values. Well, we used to have to enhance transfer values, but uh, most of the people that I know that have been looking at transfer values towards the end of last year and through into this year uh, have probably been surprised what a normal transfer value would deliver for them. So we're certainly seeing more appetite for that sort of thing. So that's on the managing the liabilities element. So that's clearly something that's evolved and more options around that, and also on the investment strategy side. So it wasn't that long ago that small schemes, and I'm never quite convinced what a small scheme is, they, they all seem as challenging as, as the big schemes, um, but let's say it was less than 100 million, it was more challenging to enter into things like liability-driven investment. That's clearly not a challenge anymore. I think one of the big challenges is explaining the benefits of it both to trustees and sponsors. Anyone who's been trained well will come out of it feeling they know more about it and have more appetite for it, but there's nothing worse than feeling less informed after having uh, gone through the process. So uh, I guess the lesson out of things like that is just making sure that you get the right person giving you the right level of information. Then there's obviously things around growth, and asset, growth asset allocation. There are more options around that. Uh, we've seen with uh, currency weakening that Currency hedging, there might be some tactical short-term decisions. Currency, I think, is a, a nil-sum game in the long term, but if you can bank a few uh, gains along the way, then people are thinking about that. And also longevity swaps. Uh, they are, if you thought LDI was complicated, to try and get your head around the longevity swap will make your brain frazzle for a little while. But again, they can be used. They can be used in increasingly smaller schemes, 
but when you use them, I think is the key here, because if you're going to transact soon, then actually the full buy-in or buy-out might be an easier way to, to achieve that same level of uh, risk reduction. I think that really takes me through my point. Yeah, thanks very much, Wayne. I think that's a really helpful look at the tools that are in the toolkit. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look at the pros and cons of actually using those tools. Um, and, and really, why de-risking can work for schemes of all sizes, from the small schemes that Wayne was just talking about right up to the larger schemes. So I think the, the key advantages we've picked out there are really one for each of the key stakeholders. Firstly, improving the funding position of the scheme. Well, that helps both the trustee and the employer in the long run. Um, but it's certainly going to make valuations and the like a lot easier for trustees. Um, tailoring the investment and, and funding to match the liabilities and reduce the contributions. Well, obviously, those reduced contributions are going to be very attractive to the employer, but also um, reducing the level of risk and uh, making sure that the benefits are going to be paid is going to be attractive to both trustee and member, and ultimately to the employer as well, who doesn't want uh, the downside of, of not being able to follow through on the pension's promise. So. There are advantages for all key stakeholders in a pension scheme in using the de-risking approach. I think that the disadvantages, a lot of them um, can be born out of misconceptions and, and, and old, old myths about the, the dangers of, of de-risking and in particular the dangers of, of pension deliberation. Obviously, that remains a live issue for, for trustees and, and something which needs careful consideration. But a well-run de-risking exercise using any one of the tools that Wayne talked about earlier can, can offer significant advantages and the risk of it can be managed quite uh, quite comfortably. There is obviously the cost of the sponsor in some of the bigger ticket items, in particular the buyout um, or purchasing any sort of insurance policy, although obviously if you have planned for that and that is your long-term goal, then uh, that can be managed over time. Um, and, and certainly managing the relationship between the trustee and the company, and in particular the trustees' concerns uh, is absolutely key to the process. So we're going to just move on and look at integrated risk management now, which is uh, the hot topic for both the regulator and, and for, for many employers and trustees. And hopefully this little graphic just easily demonstrates what integrated risk management is all about. It's about balancing investment, funding, and covenants to come up with a strategy that is in the best interest of members and also provides protection to the trustees and guarantees the engagement of the employer. And certainly when we've looked at recent uh, regulator guidance and recent case law, and even the lessons coming out of uh, situations like BHS and British Steel, the focus that's been put on integrated risk management as a better way of the trustees engaging with the employer and ensuring the long-term sustainability of the scheme is uh, absolutely key. So just moving on to look at uh, how agreeing a strategy fits in with that. I think one of the, the key things that we've taken out of IRM is that engagement and communication is absolutely vital. So even where a scheme might be distressed or where an employer might be unable to, to fund at the level it would like to, getting that engagement going, getting strategy days in place, getting a discussion going between the company and the trustee is absolutely fundamental to agreeing this strategy and moving forward with de-risking, which is ultimately in the best interest of all parties. So um, information sharing agreements, getting management information out there early to trustees, letting them know about big changes that might be coming at the employer, absolutely fundamental. So um, we believe that IRM really built on what a lot of well-advised trustee boards and um, well-engaged sponsors are already doing. It does provide that overall framework for you to use when it comes to uh, de-risking. So Wayne's going to take over now and just look at how to tailor a strategy. Yeah, so I think uh, pension strategy has not always been uh, very well thought through. Uh, sometimes that's just a business plan that people come up with that's either in Word or Excel and say, we're, in August, we're going to sign off the scheme accounts and next year we'll do an actuarial evaluation. Now, now let's be clear, that's not a strategic plan. That is just an operational plan. So really fundamentally, you've got to start from the premise of what do you want to achieve? Um, we have some clients where prospect of buyout just really is not on their radar, uh, interestingly, because one of them is an insurance company and therefore all it's doing is moving the 
uh, risk from themselves on one element of their balance sheet onto an other, another element of their balance sheet. But that's not the norm. I think most uh, sponsors nowadays probably have the view that if they could not have defined benefit pension schemes, then that wouldn't be an unacceptable place to start. But sadly, they're not starting from that position. So there are really some components that, that build on here. So what level do you want to get to? So what is your aspiration of funding, buyout, self-sufficiency? What is a realistic time frame? And, and again, I think we saw too many actuarial evaluations where it was, we'll just add three more years onto it. Well, I don't think that really helps because that doesn't help drive the investment strategy, doesn't help what you might try to do to reduce the overall liabilities. And really engaging with the employer as early as possible in the planning is key because there's no point the trustees borrowing away, doing lots and lots of work and getting very excited about it if that doesn't match the sponsor's objectives. So really bringing them along, sharing some of the benefits as you go through is really key and really demonstrating risk mitigation. And, you know, it may mean that their contributions overall might be higher, but they might, for example, be more stable. And most employers like stability of expense as opposed to having one year spending 20 million on deficit repair contributions and the next a million because you're not rewarded when you're the one paying the 20 million. And I guess our old friend, uh, optimism. Um, I think lots of schemes I've seen now where some of the people in the room have said guilt yields will revert. Um, I don't know whether revert means something different to what's actually happened, but I think it does. And therefore, this uh, ever optimism that guilt yields will rise and solve the problem clearly isn't a, a good solution. So it needs to be more tangible than that. Uh, and again, accepting that they might not, they might go down even further, which is a, a daunting prospect, but also a realistic one. So really it's sort of fitting that strategic plan with some of those tools that are available. Uh, and clearly the world is not flat. Uh, anyone who just says, well, I did this on another scheme and let's just do it again, uh, I think is missing the point. But you've got to look at the key characteristics of where you are and what you want to achieve. Many sponsors have a different long-term plan uh, and many would probably be happy with self-sufficiency as opposed to buyout. I think that's probably realistic given that if you look at the buyout market, there's not enough capacity in each of the years as it exists. So uh, clearly if we did get to yield reversion and everyone trying to buy out, that might be a bit of a challenge for us. So, so maybe that holding harbour of self-sufficiency might be a good place to be. And we saw it from the survey results, those that have done some LDI or some hedging are in happy land because they've probably seen most of the shops taken out of the system. Those that didn't do it probably do have that regret risk. Um, the big question is, if you haven't done it, should you do it now? And again, I think that's the point of, could you deal with a reduction in yields that would make the position even worse than it is? Do you want to deal with that position? Or would you prefer to accept that, to a degree, you might be locking in a little bit of that liability, but at the expense of a bit more predictability going forward? So I think they're the sort of discussions that people need to have. Um, and really, trustees are, are key in, in a lot of this, and certainly key in the liability management exercises, because to an extent, it grinds with the trustees' view that they're protecting members' interests sometimes feel aggrieved that they're being asked to consider some of the liability management exercises. But actually, there are a lot of times when it is in the member's interest to go through one of these exercises. And they might be a lot better off financially if they don't have a spouse or have shortened life expectancy than forcing a very rigid defined benefit entitlement on them. So don't always assume they're bad news. I think I, I absolutely agree with that, Wayne. And I think the key is not making any assumptions about what the other party might think. I can think of one trustee board that I've been involved with where you might have seen them as a very conservative trustee board. Actually, they were just being conservative to put themselves in a position where they could start helping out with de-risking, et cetera. Yeah. But because that had been going on for a number of years, yeah. the employer started to make certain assumptions. Actually, there's no substitute for getting everyone in a room yeah. and saying, actually, what's the plan here? Mm -hmm. And yeah, the role of an independent trustee within this, um, is really to help shape the strategy discussions. It's not 
particularly to be led by advisors. Um, we've been there and done it before, so we can um, have that collaboration with the employer and get work with the advisors to to get everyone on the same page um, and help educate as well. Um, we find that our lay trustees really look to us in some instances to, to say, you know, have you seen this before? Um, has it worked well for you? What lessons have been learned? Yeah, those war stories and making sure yeah. you don't make the mistake you make the first time you do anything, whether it's an extension on your house or entering into <laughs> LDI are, are really key things here. Yeah, and um, the ability to challenge advisors. Um, they might not like that in certain instances, but um, I think any good trustee board needs to uh, challenge their advisors and get the most efficient way of getting to the solution and, and the, um, the best way of getting there, really. Um, and we've seen, we get to see um, through all our experiences and all the trustee boards we sit on, all those new ideas that are coming to the market, whereas you know, individual lay trustees who sit on one particular board might not see that you know, they've got a narrow choice of advisors that they work with. Um, you know, when you see things like that new investments coming down to being open to smaller schemes, we may have implemented that on other schemes and we could perhaps broach that with the advisors to say, okay, might this work, might that work, um, and help shape that discussion. Um, and also when you get into buy-ins and buy-outs, you really, and, and particularly if you're a smaller scheme, if you can take a story to the insurer and prove to them, actually, we can transact this, then you'll be much in a much better position to get uh, competition in the quotes for a start and um, engagement from those advisors and proving that you've done it before will help in those discussions. Okay, so let's move on and consider what some of the possible impediments are to de-risking. And I think the way we'll uh, structure this is that uh, I will briefly be an impediment and then James will explain how I am to be overcome. <laughs> now, it may be that uh, the main impediment to de-risking may appear to be cost. And clearly, if you see de-risking primarily in terms of buyout with an insurance company, then that's understandable. Most schemes are not in a position to achieve that without a cash injection from the sponsor. And the survey results, which Ben talked through earlier, do indeed show that many sponsors are unwilling or unable to provide such a cash injection. Although interestingly, there are many for which that is not seen as the main impediment. And the solution to that, again, and I make no apologies for repeating a theme which is running through uh, this entire presentation, is the trustees and the sponsors working together to understand one another. Trustees and sponsors' interests are not always in, in perfect alignment when it comes to the running of a pension scheme, but I think we can all agree that everybody wants member benefits to be paid as they fall due and the sponsor's business to thrive. And both of those are legitimate um, considerations to be taken into account when developing any plan. And as soon as you know what it is you want to achieve, then you can plan how to achieve it. But importantly, and we'll come on to this in a moment, not all de-risking requires a cash injection from the sponsor. Cost isn't the only uh, potential impediment. Another one which has been flagged up is the uh, lack of knowledge. Many of these options are complex financial instruments and they will require trustees to take professional advice. And the solution to that clearly is to have good quality commercial advisors in position from an early stage in order to assist the trustees. So let's challenge the, uh, the preconception that um, de-risking necessarily requires cash. Well, of course, the sponsor may be willing to part with cash, as we've seen from the survey, if it's part of a strategy. A request from trustees to the sponsor to provide a blank check is unlikely to be a fruitful exercise. But as part of a strategic journey, that's another matter. So from a sponsor's perspective, if step one was to close the scheme to future accrual, step two, naturally, is to look to de-risk it. And the trustees need to understand 
what the employer's level of risk tolerance is. They also need to um, be mindful of what other concerns and legitimate interests the employer may be needing to address. So the employer may not want to set its technical provisions assumptions by reference to achieving buyout, but might agree to a secondary funding objective, which we see increasingly in practice. They may be concerned about uh, overfunding the scheme and a surplus being trapped within it, in which case contributions can be diverted into escrow accounts. So there are solutions to be found to most issues through a conversation. And most importantly, it's quite possible that buyout may not be realistic for this scheme at any given time, but that doesn't mean that the scheme can't de-risk. And James is going to talk uh, a little bit more about de-risking on the investment side. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose when you talk to employers and, and talk about de-risking, the, the first uh, impression may be, oh, you're going to uh, move all their equities or growth assets and move a large chunk of them into maybe gilts and bonds and those which uh, you know, help protect the liabilities. Um, I think the first stage in any de-risking of in investments or in any long-term plan on de-risking strategy is to sit down in with the employer and actually understand what are the risks faced by this scheme and you know, what's our current asset allocation and can we do something a bit more efficient with that, which doesn't necessarily mean let's reduce the, like, the investment returns on our assets. You can do quite a lot specifically with LDI investments that are much more efficient than those gilts and bonds that you may hold to get better protection uh, on interest rates and inflation, but also retain the uh, investment returns you want to get on your growth assets. So have that sensible grown-up conversation with the employer, understand the risks, both the trustees and the employer, and, and say, look, you know, this is something simple we can do. We're not saying you know, our investment returns are going to go down X percent because you know, we want more certainty. But you can do an initial step and say, OK, if we can get more efficient here, then that reduces the downside risks you have. And then there could be a longer term plan there to gradually increase the hedging on interest rates and inflation um, over time to reduce those funding shocks. Um, so we talk about LDI being on the um, matching asset side about something you can do to de-risk. On the growth asset side, there's been quite a shift from equities to diversified growth funds over the last few years. Um, starting to see question marks um, in the last year or so about whether they're going to produce the returns that required. And now there's other um, assets out there, illiquid type assets that are getting more accessible to the smaller end of schemes, uh, things like direct lending. They, again, are options to help reduce the volatility in your growth asset returns. So once you've got a structure around what your asset allocation is and perhaps how that might change over time if you take market gains and reduce the, the risks you're taking, you can perhaps think about liability management exercises to go in with this, with this plan. Are they feasible? For some smaller schemes, they may not be. It might, you know, the cost associated with getting the advice, um, you know, providing independent, independent financial advice to members if necessary, could outweigh the potential cost savings. Um, but you, you can do that work to see whether it would, would be something that would work for you. Um, and that could be a tool that's used to help reduce liabilities. And then finally, buy-in, buy-out, or longevity swaps. Um, if you're going, if the long-term aim is to buy out, then perhaps longevity swaps aren't the way forward. Um, it may be more um, efficient to go straight to a buy-in of pensioners. Um, but schemes that are looking to be self-sufficient and maybe at the larger end, longevity swaps may be useful. Um, but they're 
you know, something to sit down with with the employers plan from day one about what your long term plan is. I guess that leads us on to how would you get to that sort of end nirvana if buying out pension schemes is nirvana. <laughs> uh, I guess part of that route really brings us to benefit specifications because no one can uh, secure those liabilities without a good benefit specification. Um, that's not the scheme booklet, that's a little bit more. So I think we're going to touch on some of the practical challenges around data, but also how you align that with the benefit specification. So I guess what is clean data? Uh, I think everyone describes their data as being clean. I see lots of schemes where uh, it's a bit like buying a fridge. You get that A rating and you think it's delighted. You're delighted with it only to find out that there's an A plus 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 version that you really needed. So uh, really focusing on what proper data is and really what the insurers are using that data for is pretty key here. So don't enter into this project thinking you're probably there because most schemes are often surprised at how many things are missing. Also taking that in parallel with the benefit specification to figure out whether the benefits have been administered in the way that you should have been administering them can be a challenge sometimes to, to getting things tidied up. So if you get there, trustees who engage with insurers in advance will get better prices when you can demonstrate that you've gone through this process because they're making fewer assumptions around what risks they're taking on. Uh, sadly, size does matter. Um, bigger schemes with bigger names, for some reason uh, insurers are attracted to names sometimes, can get better terms than a small scheme that's just got a small liability that they want to secure. The way around that sometimes is for them to be packaged up with others, or if it's part of a wider group, you might have one smaller DB scheme with others to follow. You can use the small one as a seed to um, develop the relationship with that insurer. And I guess one of the practical challenges that we see uh, is that uh, most businesses reward uh, people for what happens in a year, a financial year, a, uh, an assessment year, whatever you want to call it for themselves. And sometimes insurers get hungrier for business and sometimes they get too much business. So, uh, picking your time to transact can be quite key in all of this, but if you're a good engaged partner with them that can transact with a bit of flexibility, then you're going to match yourself up a lot better than, than if you don't. So we've really touched maybe on a couple of these points already that high common and conditional data scores do not mean that benefits have been calculated in the way they should have been. Uh, I've seen it too many times where People say, I didn't realize I had that benefit or we had to do that, uh, which leads on to a whole different discussion um, and in many cases will slow down or stop the process of securing uh, the scheme with the insurance company. If I was an insurer, you know, I'd want to take comfort in the benefits being properly administered. So it is rightly something that they should expect from trustees. And the better you can do it, the more independently and objectively you can put that forward, the more likely you are to be considered transaction ready. And don't forget that there's loads of other stuff that normally doesn't really matter until a member passes away or leaves the scheme, but will be important for the insurers to, to firm up their pricing. So spouses, dates of birth, those sorts of things are really key. And many schemes are pretty poor in this area. So Again, we're really talking about there's an extra A triple plus rating that we need to get to rather than just being A on that scale. Okay, so let's uh, talk a bit about some of the issues when it comes to uh, putting together a benefit specification and why this matters. Well, why it matters is that um, the trustee's obligation is to provide the benefits which are set out in the rules of the scheme, not the benefits as per the member booklet or the administration manual. But an insurer will still need those rules to be codified, and that's the function of the benefit specification. And there are a number of issues with that. So it may be that the rules are unclear, and indeed, experience of talking to administrators, it's quite common to say that um, 
the rules themselves are not sufficiently detailed for them to know exactly how to administer the scheme. They have to su supplement it with administration practices. So those need to be codified into the benefit specification. It may be that not all aspects of the benefit design are apparent from the rules because pension scheme benefits are also affected by overriding legislation in areas such as increases, contracted out benefits, etc. And how the scheme interprets and applies those obligations, again, needs to be set out clearly. We have uh, experience of schemes which have um, historic administration practices that actually go beyond the strict legal requirements, but members are still accustomed to receiving benefits that have been determined in that way, and when they moved to transact with an insurer, they wanted that to be taken into account. So that all needs to be written down. And the more negative flip side of that is there are situations where the administration of the plan is simply inconsistent with the rules, and that's something, if it's occurred, that you want to find out sooner rather than later. I certainly had experience of uh, a scheme which was looking to buy out, and as part of the insurer's due diligence, it became apparent that the way it was applying an aspect of the benefit design was incorrect, and this material affected its liabilities and put the buyout out of reach. And that's the sort of thing you don't want to be discovering during the heat of a transaction. So this all comes back to the point of planning ahead and being transaction ready. Another uh, common misperception is that it's only the most recent consolidation of the rules which are relevant. So people tend to refer to the most recent consolidation and any subsequent amendments. But typically they will include grandfathering provisions so that people who'd already left service by that time continue to be governed by the older deeds. And so it becomes even more essential to have re reviewed all the deeds and codified the results in a single document, which is the benefit specification. And the consequences of mistakes in any of this is, of course, overpayments and underpayments to members. Now, that, uh, that, that might all sound like a lot of work. And indeed, in certain circumstances, it can be. So is it worth it? Well. Clearly, if you're targeting buyout, yes, as I said, it's as well to be prepared and to have the work done in advance to avoid problems later. Even for schemes that are not um, in a position to buy out, however, they still have some advantages as a risk management tool. Um, it's generally regarded as wise to avoid lifting lids off cans of worms, and that's understandable certainly in the context of pension schemes. With any pension scheme that has any degree of history, I think it's a safe bet that if you go actively looking for problems, you are likely to find some. But there's a difference between actively looking for problems and making sure you understand your benefit design, which is a core part of trustees' duties and good governance. And so, although trustees may have protection against liability in the form of uh, either an indemnity from the sponsor or insurance, Clearly, the best form of protection is simply to pay the right benefits in the first place. And the fact that you haven't discovered a problem doesn't mean that that problem will never come back to bite you. It merely means it's likely to come out at a, at a less convenient time at, at which it could be addressed. And therefore, being prepared is, has clear advantages. Okay. so. I'm very going to I'm going to run through quite quickly actually at this stage the practical issues of pitfalls because I want to give uh, Wayne and James a little bit of time to talk about how the market's looking in 2017 and also to give a bit of time for questions. Um, just to really to build out on some of the points that uh, Chris just made there, the importance of resolving these issues at the outset. It simply costs you more money if you don't. It is so much harder to negotiate pricing once it's been agreed. If exclusivity has been granted to a preferred insurer at that stage, you are all but locked in trying to negotiate the price then it's like trying to push back the tide so it's it's very important to address these problems at an early stage um, another practical issue that often crops up later in the piece than you would expect is trustee protection you need to make sure the trustees are off the hook if we're buying out the scheme or if we're doing a, a full-scale buy-in um, and you would be amazed how many times that gets put to the back of the list mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the trustee raises his hand and says hang on actually what happens the next day um, and just moving on to the next slide, in practical issues for the, the pension scheme itself and for administrators, and in particular if it's in-house administration, um, making sure that you've done all your due diligence, making sure that you've looked under every desk and in every back of cupboard that you can possibly find, 
and cleared those out because otherwise you might find some nasty surprises in there. You might find a large supply of data coming through after you've agreed your pricing and after you've agreed exclusivity and nobody wants that happening. So we've certainly had experience of that in practice where a lot of material can come out at the, at the last minute. Um, it, it is, it is a, a bit of a Boy Scouts motto, always be prepared, but when it comes to buy-ins and buy-outs, it, it couldn't be more true. I, I certainly concur with that and, and some of the practical experiences we've seen where you, know, you, you get an initial price for the insurer and then whilst you're winding the scheme up and tidying all the data up, then you're, you're expecting this final premium to come through, but you don't quite know what that amount is. And if you can get a lot of the work done up front, then you won't get that surprise later down the line. Okay, okay so briefly uh, a piece on de-risking in 2017 and into the future. I think we, we see schemes in um, rather simplistically two camps, those that have done significant interest rate hedging um, and they will, even with gilt yields falling, will have seen perhaps their growth assets perform rather well since Brexit and have the ability to look into buying in the pensioners or buying out the full um, assets. And those that haven't been so well protected against gilt yield falls, actually we're now starting to see more engagement with employers saying, look, we have been ploughing money into this scheme without our funding levels increasing, um, so we really need to start considering a long-term strategy um, with that. The buyout market is interesting. Last Yesterday I saw um, an article that said last year there was 10, mil 10, million, 10 billion, sorry, pounds, <laughs> 10 million, not much, 10 billion <laughs> pounds worth of uh, buy-in, buy-out activity last year for the third year in a row. Um, and I can see that continuing into the future. I think the challenge is, is when the insurance market starts to um, not have the capacity to take on the, the requirements for all the pension schemes out there. Um, smaller schemes, we've had challenges ourselves on some of our schemes to get competition in pricing. You may have to go to an exclusive insurer to just get your foot in the door. Um, We'd be able to group these schemes together. There's challenges there, certainly, but there's definitely um, products out there. And make sure you are transaction ready because insurers are busy. They are the ones calling the shots. If you want them to be interested in your scheme, you need to create that story for them. And I think it's much more a conversation between the insurer and the trustee than, than a classic insurance model. It's, it's very yeah. much a work together and, and make sure that you've got all the information on the table before you start. And just remember that things don't get better the longer you leave them. So even if you think you're not going to buy out until 15, 20 years' time, um, once the office has moved three or four times and all those important documents that you need at the very end, which is a fairly common theme, um, try and grab them now and digitise them in some way. It's a crumbling microfiche at the back. It's a filing cabinet that's yeah. a particular excitement, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so we've just got a couple of minutes now just for a couple of questions. Um, the first one, and this just really goes to the theme that Chris was pointing out about communication, but as trustees, what would you do if your employers are just not engaging on these issues? Are there any soft tactics or anything uh, a little bit more... Uh, aggressive that one can do to, to try and encourage employers to get into the room? Yeah, I mean, I think generally my view on any relationship, especially one that's financial, be that marriage or having a DB <laughs> pension scheme together, is very similar. In <laughs> it, it is not a good negotiation to start off by kicking people in the shin because uh, <laughs> it's not something that's going to end up well, I don't think. So uh, I think you do have to start off with the benefits of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Often, cost is seen as an issue and I think you just need to say we're discharging it. We're going to need to do it at some point. We're going to do it as efficiently as we can and the sooner we do it probably the more efficient it will be to get some of the, the foundations in place. You will however get employers and I'm thankful that it's actually a very small population of employers who are unwilling to engage at that time. If they're choosing to do that then yeah maybe you do have to be a little bit tougher but keep that in reserve because once you've um, pulled out the loaded gun it's very difficult to rebuild that relationship afterwards. Okay, and we just have one final question 
It's just talking around the Ben spec and asking whether this is going to provide a standardized way which might support uh, consolidation of DB uh, funds into some sort of super fund, which is very much a, a buzz topic coming out of things like the Green Papers. Yeah, I think I think that's a very interesting that's a very interesting point actually, and certainly consolidation uh, is something which is being actively looked at. It's in the DWP Green Paper. It's something the regulator is very interested in, also for small schemes in particular. And there are a number of vehicles out there which will seek to provide that for DB schemes. Um, I think they, the question that actually just underlines the point I was making, that a benefit specification serves many purposes other than just preparing the scheme for buyout. Um, clearly, an understanding of the benefit design is necessary for any such process, as it's necessary for running the scheme on according to the status quo, as it's necessary for preparing to buy it out with an insurer. So, yeah, I think it's a good point. I think we're some way off a standardized uh, product in the line that uh, you introduced to Ian. But, yeah, I think it's a good point. I think the, the nearest is mm -hmm. insurers that like mm -hmm. Benspecs in a certain way, but, but you know, Benspecs will have some similarities, but mm -hmm. there'll be quite a lot of differences it, as well. We certainly see, in practice, a huge amount of variety in uh, approach. I've seen some which are very concise. I've seen some which are very long. Some are very text-based. Some are based on spreadsheets. So there is certainly a wide range of different approaches that's taken to them, yes. Perfect. Well, first, I'd just like to thank our speakers. Thank you very much for that absolutely fascinating uh, presentation. Um, just to mention before we finish, um, there'll be a feedback uh, question that pops up on your uh, screen. If you can provide any feedback, that'd be really useful for us shaping future webinars and providing uh, the sort of information that you're most interested in. There's also the download tab where you'll be able to get some more information uh, around the webinar. And also we'll be putting a, rec a recording of the webinar along with a transcript on our website. And what we're going to do is let you know when that happens. So if you've got any colleagues that are interested but couldn't make it today, then they'll be able to watch or read uh, in their own time. Uh, so that's all from all of us. So thank you very much and hope to uh, see you very soon at another Gal in WLG webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.